Cool. So, hi everyone. Thanks for um, turning up this morning. And uh, impressed to see that one or two people are even sitting in the front row, which I never did at school, uh, if I could help it. Uh, my name's Will, and I'm going to be talking about the visibility system that we use in Horizon Zero Dawn that's part of our Decima engine. So, a little bit about what this talk is about. Um, I've been making games for a while. Uh, I've started with a ZX81 when I was about, I don't know, seven or something like that, and didn't make anything very worthwhile with it, but I definitely caught the bug at that point. Uh, I worked in the UK for a while at um, Particle Systems in Sheffield, which was an awesome company that sadly went down the drain after being bought by Argonaut. And um, I started um, contracting for Gorilla fairly soon after moving to this hemisphere. Uh, I now live on your West Island. So Gorilla is a first party Sony studio that's traditionally been known for really awesome art and technology. Uh, we haven't always had the most efficient workflow, but we've been paying a lot of attention to that uh, during the development of Killzone 4 and Horizon. And we're now um, getting pretty good at it. And because the studio is so big, workflow is a really important axis to optimize. I mean, you optimize for different things, you know, memory or speed or network throughput or whatever. And we think that optimizing for workflow is quite a big deal because if you've got 200 people who are all wasting five minutes a day on something that you didn't do cleanly enough, um, that's a lot of wasted time and money. Uh, the flip side of that is once you've got good workflow, optimizing for performance becomes important again because your artists have more time to create awesome content and uh, you've then got to deal with all the content that they're creating. And our in-house engine has acquired a name recently. It's now called Decima. It's been used to create the Killzone series of games across multiple platforms. Uh, so not just sort of PS3 and PS4, but um, PSP and Vita as well. And um, obviously uh, Horizon is uh, built on Decima and um, Kojima Productions Death Stranding is also using the Decima engine on PS4. So Horizon, hopefully you're familiar with it. It's the game with the robot dinosaurs. Um, <laughs> it's quite cool because, you know, most people actually have heard of something that I've worked on. I find that exciting. Um, it's a really big departure from Killzone, which was a fairly linear um, first-person shooter series with narrow areas connecting wider play spaces. And we kind of shifted a, a bit towards the Horizon model in Killzone 4, which had much larger um, play spaces, but it was still not an open world game. And creating an open world game is such a big departure from that. We wanted a really big world with lots of detail. And this obviously created uh, new challenges for our engine. Um, the biggest issues are probably the variable density of content. So, you know, an open area might be quite low on active content. Um, versus uh, some of the cities or the, the cauldrons, which are like underground dungeons, uh, were very, very dense. And uh, we also had to keep headroom for uh, enemy encounters, which could happen spontaneously. So, yeah, lots of interesting problems to solve. Now, I haven't got a pretty video of Horizon, because really I need to keep all the extraneous stuff as fast as possible to get through things. But I do have some screenshots from the um, photo mode. Uh, it is a very pretty game. And we want to be able to draw stuff all the way to the horizon, so um, we need you know, infinite draw distance. So where did we come from? Um, before talking about what we did, I'll talk a little bit about where we started at the beginning of the project for the visibility side of things. Our existing 3D models are seen by the game as a tree of what we call mesh resources, which can be an arbitrarily complex tree. And the main types of things in that are LOD mesh resources, where each branch of the tree represents a different LOD level and uh, has distances that that level should be drawn. Uh, we have multi meshes, which, where each branch of the tree is a chunk of mesh data, which is transformed relative to the multi mesh. And we have static mesh resources, which are the leaf nodes of the tree and actually contain the, the geometry. So their transforms relative to an object are determined by what multi-meshes they're attached underneath, and whether they're selected for LOD is determined by the mix of LOD meshes um, in that tree. And there are other leaf node types, but they're all dynamic and not really relevant to this talk. So this is a very flexible system. You can compose stuff however you like, which is great for building different content workflows, 
but it makes it harder to pin down and extract the behaviors that you want to aim for when you're optimizing. When we've got these mesh resources, we um, place them in the world as what we call durable objects. And these have a more efficient kind of flat encoding of the mesh resource tree, which is what we use at runtime for determining what things are in it and what we need to draw. One particular issue which has caused me a certain amount of pain is that no mesh resource knows that it's the root of a tree um, because they can be kind of recomposed in all sorts of different ways and things can refer to one another. You can't go, right, this one's the root of a tree. We can put some stuff there that we need to use. Uh, it's only when it's placed in the world by a drawable object that um, that's clear. So the um, mesh resource, the mesh instance tree has its leaves which sort of map onto the leaves of the mesh tree, the static mesh resources of these things called durable setups, which are what we feed to the renderer and what kind of isolates it from the uh, data format to some extent and the rest of the content. So a durable setup is like a little piece of geometry with um, whatever shaders and state are needed to draw it. And on top of that, we have a KD tree for spatial hierarchy, or we did. So to query that, we would um, find visible drawable objects by walking the KD tree. And um, we would frust and curl those. And then we would walk the mesh instance tree for those drawable objects to find the visible drawable setups, uh, descending into the, the log that was appropriate for the, the current view. And we would frust and cull the drawable setups and output a list of the drawable setups for the renderer to draw. And in Killzone 3, we also occlusion culled each object and set up using software occlusion culling on the PS3 SPUs. And for Killzone 4, we used Umbra middleware for static content, which handled all the visibility, including the occlusion for us. So our queries are CPU jobs, which are part of the general rendering job graph. We have kind of a flexible job architecture on the CPU, and most code and all rendering code uh, runs in jobs rather than on the main thread. We knew there were going to be some problems with this going forward, and some of them we'd already experienced, and some of them we could just predict would be problems. Um, it wasn't going to be good enough for the world size of Horizon, and we needed to reduce the complexity of the KD tree, since we'd be rebuilding it often as content streamed in. And we wanted to run fewer mesh instance tree queries, since those were pretty expensive. And we also had the problem that the API for kind of putting stuff in the scene was really aimed at adding and removing fairly large pieces of content. And with the uh, building blocks that the Horizon world is made of, um, we had lots and lots and lots of very small objects. So a building block might be a piece of column or a stair in a staircase or something like that. And those are all placed individually in the scene by the artists or you know, composed into prefabs and places like that. So we needed to be able to add stuff um, fast. So what did we build instead? So, I said that we used visibility middleware, and that caused us some um, workflow problems because it uh, needed a pre-computation step to build uh, whatever structures it used for determining what was visible. And this just it didn't fit into how we were working. Uh, it increased the time needed to properly test changes because while you could start up the game without the visibility data, it wouldn't run properly until it had finished building in the background. So you couldn't kind of get an idea of what was happening instantly. Um, we still shipped the game with it, but we didn't think it would work for Horizon. I find it quite hard to give up the idea of pre-computation, but it is liberating because if nobody's doing pre-computation, you're not working on pre-computation code, which means you're not waiting for long time to long, you know, cycle times to test your pre-computation code. And so it, it does become kind of quick. And obviously we also needed to handle all the new content and handle it faster than we were already doing. So the new system is called the static scene, and we built a single purpose system to ease the load on the existing multi-purpose system. Uh, static scene obviously just handles static geometry since that's what we have the most of by like a huge amount. And we could use the existing system to handle the remaining dynamic geometry and run the jobs in parallel so it wouldn't massively affect the overall latency. Uh, we also, because we knew we had so much stuff, wanted to use the um, PlayStation 4's asynchronous compute capability uh, we thought that would be better able to handle the amount of content and would be relatively easy to synchronize with the CPU because you can kind of synchronize just between compute and CPU without needing to um, coordinate with the graphics ring. Uh, 
to build, I showed the kind of mesh resource tree earlier and said that it's arbitrarily complex, but it turns out that um, we wanted to, we, we could identify some patterns that we could use in the data that we had. We wanted to feed compute with something fairly flat, uh, so we needed some constraints on the mesh resource trees. And in many of our static mesh resources, uh, we have a kind of two kinds of log level. One is a building block log made of whole lots of building blocks placed with respect to one another. And um, the other kind of LOD is a collapsed LOD, which is generated by tools from the building blocks, which is a single kind of leaf node of mesh geometry. And um, the building blocks themselves also have LOD nodes internally. So when you're up close, you get lots of different detail levels in, at, of different objects. And when you're further away, you get big, chunky detail levels of bigger objects. And the nice thing about that was that the two LOD levels were enough to represent all of those trees. And here they're called um, parent and child, and they have the bounds of the LOD mesh resource and the um, LOD bracket, so that the start and end range that that branch is visible. And a leaf node in the tree is visible if and only if both the parent and child LODs are visible. So that could kind of capture the, uh, the LOD visibility. And to avoid special cases, we add empty LOD levels so that everything has two. We make everything fit into the same structure because we want it to be flat and consistent. And any content that didn't fit this, and there were a few meshes that were more complicated, uh, we just pushed back to the dynamic system and the artists gradually removed them over time. To cull all this data, we obviously need some spatial structure. And at the top level, we split the world into static tiles, which are sometimes true spatial tiles, like a rectangular region of the world. And sometimes there are other things like settlements and encounters. And the static tiles are defined by the streaming system. And the static scene didn't get to choose what the static tiles would be. And that, again, sounded a bit scary, but it actually worked out quite well. The tiles are created so that they're immutable and can't be updated, which simplifies things. So we don't need to kind of handle piecemeal updates to tiles. And in the tiles, we have a bunch of stuff on the GPU, uh, basically buffers of things that roughly map onto the things that we've got on the CPU. So query objects represent drawable objects, query setups represent drawable setups, and uh, query instances kind of are one instance of a drawable setup from one object. So that's something that's placed de definitively in the world. And those are what we map to the compute threads individually. And uh, we also have matrix and bounding box data in separate buffers, which is um, loaded indirect to save space. And on the CPU, we have uh, what we call clusters, which are kind of coherent lists of instances um, with overall bands and LOD so that we can do a kind of first level cull there. Uh, since shipping horizon, I should say that we've made some changes to support batch rendering, and I'm going to talk about that later. Um, the data formats that I'm describing here are the new ones since I didn't think there'd be time to cover both. But briefly, we used to have smaller query instances and larger query setups since each drawable setup had its own local to object space transform. And for batching, we remove all the transforms to get the best possible sharing between the drawable setups and instead use sort of where the drawable setup is within the mesh resource tree to figure out what its transform should be and store that in the scene <coughs> data rather than in the drawable setup. Um, to save space, all the elements other than the query instance are hashed and stored exactly once per tile with the instances looking up by index. And again, that's a, a post-chipping change. That's not quite how we had the data in Horizon. Um, it does mean that this structure has grown quite big, and indeed it has two whole bits spare for the future, so I'm sure that will be plenty and not cause us any problems at all. Um, but you ain't going to need it, right? Or at least we don't need it at the moment. Um, the data is mostly indices and some filter bits which we use to pick sort of shadow casters versus visual messages, messages versus dynamic shadow casters. And the um, parent and child LOD information for the tree path that the um, instance is in. Uh, we also have these query setups and query objects. Um, each of these is stored once per tile, so packing them is less important. There are way fewer of these than the instances. Um, the game world uses a high precision coordinate system to avoid problems caused by um, floating precision away from the origin, uh, whereas the renderer works mostly in a floating coordinate space which follows the camera around. So for the object, we pass in a high precision transform which is snapped to a one meter integer grid uh, with a matrix relative to that. And the query shader 
sort of subtracts the camera origin from that and produces a floating matrix as output. Uh, so that's most of what's in the query object. And the query setup um, has accurate local banding information because we could use the LOD bands that we've already got for banding, uh, for frust and culling, but they tend to be bigger than the, um, the objects partly because they're stored in object space, so they're transformed relative to the, the geometry. So if you've got like a rotated column, it will have bigger bands. And partly because they're an aggregate across all the um, LOD uh, levels at a particular LOD mesh resource so that the LOD distances behave in a consistent way. Loading these tiles, uh, our streaming system loads and unloads objects on a background thread since that can obviously take several frames to happen. And the static seam receives sets of added and removed objects uh, with the adds and removes matched up by the streaming system so we don't have to deal with partial unloads, which is partly why we have tiles that we don't kind of recreate. Uh, we just throw away and make a new one because usually we either create a tile or we destroy a whole tile in one go. Um, generally, a group of added objects defines one static tile, but if it's like huge, more than 24,000 instances, then we split it up. And if it's really small, under 1,000 instances, then we add the objects to what I call the orphan tile, which is sort of all the stuff that doesn't have a proper place to go. Um, that tile does get rebuilt quite often, but A, it's small, and B, this all happens on the streaming thread, so it doesn't really hinder the game. Uh, in fact, all the heavy lifting happens on the streaming thread, and the main thread just has to make the tiles active when they become available. We obviously need a spatial partition to break up this data because while compute is very fast, feeding all the data to compute is silly. Um, and we have a couple of levels for this. The static tile provides a first level since they're pretty spatially coherent as they are. And we define a kind of spatial with a bit more partition within each tile, uh, which gives us clusters that we can um, cull. We um, generate a sort key for each query instance using the filter bits, uh, the maximum log range for the instances uh, for the instance and um, the Morton number which I'll talk about in a sec. The filter allows us to quickly discard clusters that aren't relevant to a query and the LOD range does a similar thing for really dense areas of high detail content because that generally is not visible from too far away and at a lower level the Morton numbers give a kind of degree of spatial coherence which helps us make clusters that are local. After the sorting, we use the changes in the sort keys to determine the clusters. And again, we have a minimum size here, which is currently 4K instances to help with load balancing. And each cluster is what could become a compute job. The Morton numbers, um, and the picture has come up, which is great because it wasn't doing that earlier, um, were introduced by Guy McDonald Morton in the 60s as a way of mapping between n-dimensional coordinates and a one-dimensional value. Uh, has anyone heard of Morton numbers? OK, cool. So it's worth putting this slide in. Um, we start by quantizing a position to some um, integer grid at whatever resolution you want and um, interleave the components of the integer uh, position bit by bit. So you take like a bit from x and then a bit from y and a bit from z. And then for bit, you, the next sort of three bits, you take another bit from x, another bit from y, and another bit from z. And in 3D, that's a lot like what you do when you build a regular octree. And the increasing Morton numbers follow a z-order curve like the one in the picture. So this is in 2D. And you can sort of see that x goes across and y goes down. And you know it, it does make sense. But it's probably worth reading up on external to this talk if you're interested. Uh, the neat thing about Morton numbers is you can compute them quickly with bit tricks. And um, if they're close together, then the positions are generally close together too. So they're good for kind of quick and dirty um, spatial structure. Having built our data, we want to execute queries on it. And like the old system, we create a CPU job for each query that runs within the render job graph. And it runs in parallel with the dynamic query job so the latencies don't add up. We use the tile and cluster hierarchy to skip as many clusters as possible on the CPU and dispatch one compute job for each visible cluster. Then the CPU job waits for compute to finish. And this is nice and simple. And it means our scheduler doesn't have to deal with um, synchronizing CPU and GPU stuff. Spooky. There are more settings. We can have dim. But this is, this is like semi-dim. Um, yeah, so that, that's a simple way to synchronize. And it means that the compute sync is contained within one CPU job. And it doesn't kind of need to be extended outside that. I guess that's something we may want to revisit in the future. 
Usually when we were waiting for a result like this, um, where I've put wait for compute, we would pick up more work from the job scheduler uh, so that we wouldn't have an idle thread. But because the wait is not very long and the query is critical path, we don't in this case. We want to get the data as soon as possible and it's worth going idle for a short while to do that. Uh, the GPU compute jobs uh, dispatch a single Uber shader, uh, but we actually specialize that into a handful of um, compile time variants for different cases like rendering the main camera or rendering the sun shadow. Uh, these will have reduced instruction and register count versus the generic shader, which helps the um, compute units run more uh, groups of threads at a time. We only use the generic shader, in fact, when query options are switched from their default settings, which is a kind of debug thing rather than a real game thing. And the shader is pretty long. It's about 300 instructions or something like that. Within the compute job, each thread loads a query instance and tests the filter bits to see if it can skip all the work. And otherwise, it goes ahead and indirectly loads the bands and matrices in order to perform the LOD and visibility tests. And if at least the parent LOD test passes, we do both child LOD and accurate uh, visibility tests since we need both results to update the LOD fade states. We also um, check mesh streaming availability at this point. We stream kind of mesh and texture data independently of object streaming, and we can't render something where the mesh data is streamed out because it will crash. So we don't want to draw those. Once we've done the visibility tests, uh, we can update the LOD fade state, which means kind of looking at the LOD fade state from the previous frame and looking to see whether something is in the frustum and whether it's selected by uh, level of detail and um, either fading in or fading out or keeping the same as appropriate. And then we store that back so that we've got the next value for the uh, flowing frame. And that only happens for player camera queries at the moment. Uh, if something's invisible at this point, we can just stop. Otherwise, we allocate space for it in the output buffer. And because the output buffer is shared by all jobs and threads in the query, we have to synchronize access to it using a global counter. And we update that atomically. And once we have an address to write to, each thread can just write its drawable setup and transform to the output buffer. Now, I've mentioned aggregated atomics here, and I'm going to talk about those next, because they're cool. Uh, just before I get into more detail on compute stuff, some general terminology. Has anyone seen at least one of the things on this slide? Ooh, awesome. Okay, so a wavefront is uh, what we call an invisible block of threads, an uh, indivisible block of threads executing in lockstep, and PS4 wavefronts are 64 wide. If you've used um, CUDA, uh, they're, they're called warps, and they're th on NVIDIA hardware, they're 32 threads wide. LDS, or the local data store, is fast memory that's local to the threads in the wavefront. Uh, a VGPR is a vector general purpose register, which has one value per thread in the wavefront. And we also have scalar registers with one value for the whole wavefront. A vector lane is one element of a vector register. So each thread has its own vector lane. Uh, ballot with a predicate value is like a bit mask of active threads where predicate is true. So on PS4, that's a 64-bit mask because we've got a 64-thread wavefront. And an atomic is a memory operation which can't be interrupted by another thread, so it's coherent with respect to other threads, and you won't get like um, wrong answers because multiple threads were working on something at the same time. So, talk briefly about aggregated atomics. All our atomic operations are aggregated across a wavefront's threads, which means that instead of using one atomic per thread, we use one atomic per wavefront. And that saves a lot of memory traffic and is a drop-in replacement for standard atomics. And there's a discussion about it on the um, uh, link there, uh, which is uh, available as a URL at the end of the talk. So I just step you through how this works as a kind of example of looking at com com compute. In this diagram, the rows of boxes show threads within a single simplified eight-thread wavefront. And the contents show what each thread is looking at during a particular stage of the process. So each column represents values that belong to a single thread. And this is obviously massively simplified because each thread will have lots of registers live at any particular point rather than just one row here. But it's a bit like looking at the auto stuff in the Visual Studio debugger where it tries to show you things that relate to the operation you've just done. The rounded boxes on the right show global buffers which are elsewhere in the GPU memory and are being operated on by this wavefront and a bunch of other wavefronts at the same time. We start with some active threads, which are the colored boxes that want to write to some output buffer. 
and we start with a counter value, uh, which is M. And we create a bit mask of the active threads using ballot, which is a scalar value. So the bit mask for the entire wavefront is uh, all in one box. So we basically have one bit for an active thread and a zero bit for an inactive thread. And this is where my notes are too big to fit on the screen. We also create a prefix sum over the bit mask by adding up all the bit values to the left of each thread in question. And this is obviously different for each thread. And um, for the active threads, you can see it counts up 0, 1, 2, 3. And then we sum the bits in the bit mask, which gives us a scalar value because there are four set bits. So the, the number of set bits is obviously four. So to actually do the atomic, um, we have we select the first thread, the first active thread, and have that perform a global atomic. So it writes the um, scalar count to our counter buffer, which then has the value m plus 4. And that value, the old value, m, is read back to the active thread and then redistributed to all the threads. I'll show you some source for that in a second. And then each thread adds its prefix sum n to m. So each thread then has its own address, which go up one by one. And then it knows where to write, and each thread can write to the output buffer, and they won't collide, and the writes will all nicely be in order as well. So that's um, the, the ordering is a, a neat side effect, and uh, actually comes in useful later. And you can see the writes are compact, and uh, the prefix sum provides the ordering. And in code, uh, no, no, that looks pretty readable. Okay, so um, the active mask is ballot true, that's basically what threads are visible. Um, we look at the first active thread by comparing the current thread's ID to the first active thread's value for the ID register. So if that's the same, we must be the current thread. And then the first thread counts up the bits in the mask and adds them to the global counter with the atomic add. And then each thread, we've gone outside the single thread active branch. Um, each thread then retrieves the first active thread's result and adds its own prefix sum to get the counter value. Now, the problem with looking at compute code is it looks like scalar code, and you don't really see which registers are vector registers and which registers are scalar registers. And most of the time, that's fine, because it's like doing a bunch of things that are the same. And occasionally, for stuff like this, uh, it's more confusing. So it's worth reading the code and then looking back at the previous slide and reading the code and so on on your own time. So that covers how things are put together, basically. And I'm now going to talk about some new stuff which didn't ship in Horizon. So in the Horizon renderer, after the query is complete, we sort the visible drawable setups by their geometry and shader, as well as the usual um, sort criteria like depth. And at the back end of the renderer, we collect batches with consistent geometry and shader and draw those as a single draw call to save um, sort of GPU setup and uh, submit. And um, this gives us kind of really good batching because we can see all the drawable setups because they're all, all there at the end of the pipeline. But it means that we paid the CPU cost for all those drawable setups earlier in the pipeline, so that's not so good. And we also only supported this for key passes like um, deferred geometry and shadow map rendering, which is where we spend most of our rendering time um, because it needed extra machinery to do the batching. We wanted to remove this extra CPU and scratch memory cost by doing the batching in the query instead at the very front of the pipeline uh, but this time we get lower batch quality since the GPU only sees like one cluster's worth of um, uh, objects at a time. But, but it's still pretty good. And currently we're using both systems, but I'm kind of hoping that we can turn off the old batching eventually and just use the new system because it'd be a lot cleaner. To do batching well, we remove transforms from the drawable setups entirely so they could be shared more effectively between instances and resources. And without this, we didn't have a great sharing rate because while the resource trees reuse resources hugely, there are quite a lot of top-level resources as placed into the world, and we got sort of sharing rates of between one and two as opposed to what we wanted, which were much higher. Um, and instead of writing drawable setups and transforms, we write drawable setup batches, which are like list headers for a list of drawable setup instances. And the batches contain things like overall bounds for the instances, the lengths of the batch, and the instances are the things that have the transforms and some other renderer state, which is uh, maintained per instance and kind of fed through. And these go in scratch memory each frame. So that, again, they don't need to be super densely packed. 
because um, we're going to throw them away. They're not you know, taking up space all the time. On the CPU to make this work, we extend the query instance sort key to sort by drawable setup instances, uh, to sort by drawable setup. And then when that sort key changes, we flag the query instance with a bit to say this is the end of a group of the same drawable setup, which means of our two free bits, we now have one left. Um, on the GPU, we use these bits to group threads by drawable setup and do the normal visibility tests and then have each active thread write a drawable setup instance where previously it would have written a drawable setup, and then have the first active thread in each group output a drawable setup batch to the output as a sort of header for the list of instances that we've just written. And this all happens within a single wavefront, or within each wavefront, I should say. So stepping through that, again, we're going to look at a simplified wavefront of eight threads. The letters show the query instance being processed by each thread, and the colors, the groups of drawable setups. Uh, I, I don't know if these are colorblind friendly colors, but there are A and B are one group, C, D, and E are one group, F is one group, and G and H is one group. And we start by loading the group end bit from the CPU, uh, the query instance, and taking a prefix sum over this to get a group index. So you can see that each group has a one and the last thread in that group. And then when you take a prefix sum over that, each group ends up having the same instance, the uh, same index. And then we do our normal visibility testing, and we end up with some threads that are inactive because the instances were invisible, and some threads that are active because we want to draw those instances. Uh, the active threads then write their instances to the first output buffer using the same kind of aggregated atomics that we did before. So we end up with an instance buffer with B, C, E, and H in it. And you can see that they are, because the aggregated atomics order the writes, then the instances are going to be coherent with respect to drawable setup. So we won't rearrange the groups when we do this. Again, I need to scroll down on the notes. The active threads also um, collate their, I need to scroll up on the notes. Their batch properties in LDS arrays shared by the entire wavefront. So the circles are an array of um, slots in LDS memory. So they don't really belong to the wavefront, but we have one for each thread. So I've aligned them underneath so you can kind of see what's going on. Um, each thread here is adding one because it provides one instance to the LDS array entry indexed by its group index. So B adds one to slot zero. C and E both add one to slot one because the gray group has index one. And that means that we add up to two there because that's a batch of length two. And uh, H adds one to slot three. And there's nothing in slot two because we didn't have any active instances that hit that slot. So I know this is confusing. I've got some more examples that might help in a second. Um, as well as in, in the real shader, we don't just collate the, uh, the batch lengths. We also like take atomic min and max of the bands to get a banding box for the entire batch. And we put together some other information that we need. Then the first active thread in each group reads back the batch data and writes the batch to the output buffer. So here we've got a batch of one instance, a batch of two instances, and a batch of one instance again. And the first active thread knows where the instance is that it needs to point to in the batch, because it was the one that wrote the instance in the first place, so it's got that number handy. Okay, so I know this is confusing, and uh, I've got a couple more examples that might help a bit. So here's an example that shows what happens if there's one big batch, so everything has the same durable setup. Um, the group index is uh, zero for each thread, because they're all in group zero. And the instances written are exactly as they were before. And all threads collate their batch counts of one to slot zero. So we get one batch of length four. And finally, there's only one group, so we only write one entry to the batch buffer, which is one batch pointing to four instances. OK. And the other example is when all the drawable setups are different. So here, the group indices are the same as the thread indices, because every thread is the end of a group. And this is basically what it's like when you don't do the batching. Uh, so every thread gets a different group index because the prefix sum over all the ones just goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 
Again, we write the same list of instances. That bit never changes. But when we collate, each thread has its own group, so we get batches of length one. And each active thread writes out its batch, giving four batches of one instance each. Phew. Um, so hopefully that makes some kind of sense. Now, this is a pretty simple scheme, and that has some really big advantages. We don't need any extra machinery storage or passes to uh, do the batching. It's just something we can sort of stick on the end of the shader. And it writes to the, the same format that we were using before, and everything just works. And there are other ways we could do this. We could, for example, have maintained a linked list in GPU memory per drawable setup. And every time we added an instance of a drawable setup, we'd add one entry to the linked list for that setup. But then we kind of have to collate that data later or update everything to consume these linked lists, which we didn't want to do. Uh, so here, everything, everything just works. We lose some spatial coherence because we have to sort by drawable setup before sorting by Morton number. But that only really affects the efficiency of the culling system, not the renderer. And uh, generally, it's better to have the culling system be slightly less efficient and draw less stuff than the other way around. The, the sort of fixed downside is that we now have a max batch length of 64, the wavefront size. But saving one, you know, reducing the work from 64 to 1 is still quite a big saving. And uh, that's fine for most of our batching. Uh, we use a chunk of LDS memory that we weren't using before, which could affect our um, shader occupancy, so the number of wave fronts that the um, GPU can run in the same compute unit at the same time. Because it, it will, um, if a wavefront doesn't need very many registers or very much LDS, it can coexist with another wavefront. Um, but because we're actually limited by registers, the extra LDS doesn't matter, and it will only be when we get the register count down that we'll need to start squeezing LDS uh, to increase occupancy. And obviously, we needed a new data format to do this, where the query instances, which are the most numerous thing, are a lot bigger. But by packing the data and indexing it, we were able to make the overall data footprint smaller. So it was still a, a win. And that's where we are at the moment. So a few stats. The static scene handles really quite a lot of data, uh, usually between 500,000 to 1.5 million instances, which could be potentially visible at a single camera position. Um, that's really too much for the CPU, I think, to deal with as, as individual things. But we want the fine-grained culling, so we do deal with it as individual things. The GPU data to represent this isn't too big, but as always, we'd like it to be a bit smaller. And um, the query time is also pretty consistent. Um, the shadow queries are usually a bit faster than the main scene queries because they either have small thruster uh, for spotlights or um, you know, for the sunlight, they have a slightly relaxed log criteria, so they're not selecting as much stuff generally. And the shadow geometry is simpler as well. There are fewer shadow instances. The changes we made for batching were really valuable. We removed about 2 thirds of the stuff going into the pipeline uh, without changing the query times much. So we added more work to the end of the query to figure out the batching, but we're actually writing less data. So overall, the time hasn't changed a whole lot. Just to illustrate the, um, the scene complexity a bit more, um, I'm sorry, there are only pictures at the beginning and end. Here is uh, a piece of jungle, which is not a great case for the static scene, because the terrain and the vegetation meshes are all dynamic. They, they're not things that move around, but they are updated quite frequently as the player moves around, and the sort of churn rate of those is too fast for the static scene to cope with well. Um, so if we remove the static geometry, we see that there's a load of rocks and things that have gone and one or two like hand-placed trees, but uh, mostly it's still there. The density of the static stuff we removed is pretty high, though. Uh, there are an awful lot of rocks, and they come in quite small pieces uh, when they go right down to it. And this is just the, the static geometry that we've selected to draw. So the really big rocks that are far away would break down to, into tiny pieces when you're up close to them as well. In a, a denser area, uh, Meridian City is one of the, the densest areas in the game. And it's nearly all static geometry. You can see there's just really terrain, a little bit of vegetation, and some sad-looking floaty people left behind. <laughs> And when we draw the bounding boxes of all the drawable setups we selected in the um, in Meridian, it's just a garbage big blue mess because there's so much stuff 
So where are we going from here? Well, we were pretty cautious with compute since this is one of the first big complicated things we did with it. Uh, and it turns out that it is very, very fast and very flexible and isn't hurting our render times as far as we can tell. Um, so we want to move more of the system from the CPU to the GPU and ideally have much of the query output stay on the GPU so the renderer doesn't need to touch it and it will just feed it forward to the shaders at the end. I think that will, that will be a really big win in the pipeline, but it's something that's going to affect quite a lot of code and it hasn't happened yet. And probably more importantly than that, we want to have the static scene take on the dynamic content. So it can render the placement meshes, and we've tried this, but it's just really slow on the CPU regenerating the tiles. So we need a kind of a lightweight tile that we can regenerate more quickly or leave gaps in or that kind of thing to handle that case. Um, I think that's going to be a really big win. And I don't know, once you've got a system and it's your system, you want to kind of pull all the content into it and expand your fiefdom. Um, so there may be a little bit of that going on. So to finish, I think PS4 co compute is great and well worth making use of it. Uh, I don't have experience of it, much experience of it with it on other platforms, but um, it's definitely an angle to, to look at, particularly asynchronous compute, which is kind of generically useful without getting involved with the graphics pipeline. It can just do stuff, and you can think of it as kind of extra processing time that you might be able to use. I also think that simple solutions are really great. Uh, do things that aren't complicated, but lots of them and very fast uh, can be quite a good way to solve problems. And really importantly, work within your studio's workflow because you don't want to upset your content creators. Uh, they need to be working all the time, not wasting time. But then you also need to build with scaling in mind so that when they make all this content, you can still draw it at the end of the project. Now, at Horizon, the content grew hugely uh, in the last kind of six to 12 months. And by tweaking our kind of minimum sizes and places where we broke clusters and um, uh, tiles, we were able to, to balance things out and the new system generally coped pretty well. So thanks very much to my colleagues at Gorilla, uh, particularly Michiel and Jeroen, who uh, said it was okay for me to come and talk to you about this today, and Roland for his uh, awesome slide uh, set with the cool waves. Right. <laughs> Any questions? I don't know how much time we've got. A little bit? Five minutes? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Yes. Okay, so where, like, does that mean your compute process is with the, actually applying all the matrix transforms and selecting, like, the lot that way, or do you have another process? No, that's, that's basically it. So the question was, um, does the compute do the kind of grunt work of, of selecting LODs? And the answer is yes. Each query instance has LOD information encoded within it, the, the ranges and the bounding boxes, um, and it will load the bounds, transform them, and it's the matrix multipliers that actually use a lot of the vector registers, which is, is you know, reducing our occupancy. They're really expensive. Um, it will load the bounds, transform them, and um, look to see whether they, that, that log range fits within the distance uh, to the camera for that object. So, yeah, it all happens in there. Yes? The tile creation, the question was, um, is the tile creation pre-build time? So do you mean before loading the game in tools or? Before you build the uh, executable, I imagine you were doing the chunking for the tile. Ah, no, that all happens at runtime. Wow. So the, the tile creation happens on the streaming thread and it's reasonably fast. You know, creating a tile takes, I don't know, a few milliseconds but it's long enough that you couldn't do it on the main thread because that would be a few milliseconds that would push you over your frame threshold and uh, cause a hitch. So the streaming thread runs, you know, not synchronized to the main thread, uh, except when data becomes available. Thanks. Anyone else? Sorry, can you just clarify regarding that question? Sure. I'm not the person to ask. Um, so from my point of view, the streaming system provides big lumps of content 
that I can load. Uh, it actually, I think, is very flexible. So stuff is, is on disk in quite small pieces. Um, but there'll be some, some ordering to make the I.O. of those pieces optimal for particular groups they're used in. But we don't kind of do a whole lot of pre-processing to create, you know, like all the geometry for, you know, going from this, this far from the origin to this far in, in two directions and, and have that as a, a flat lump that we can load. It's more like we know all the things are in that area and we need to load those. Uh, but it'd be worth, um, if you uh, ask me afterwards, I can probably put you in touch with someone who can answer that question or I can find out for you. Cool. Yes, sorry. Was there any occlusion telling? You mentioned like in the previous incarnation the occlusion was removed. Yes. I wasn't sure I'd have time to get to this because when I added the stuff about the batching, I took this out. Um, occlusion culling, we test against the depth buffer of the previous frame. Um, so we reproject bounding boxes from this frame into the past. And we have a MIP chain for that buffer. So we look at the, the MIP level where the bounding box touches four texels and compare against those, which is a pretty standard approach. Um, the neat thing is that we can use the accelerated depth buffer data, the tile data on PS4, which is in eight by eight chunks. So the amount of memory bandwidth we need to read it back is you know, a 64th of what it would be if we looked at the whole thing. That's, that's a huge win. This is actually pretty simple and effective. Um, there are some fiddly bits with scheduling when you capture it. And we, um, yeah, we, we got that working. Um, the quality isn't perfect. If you want it to be fast, it's hard to make it perfectly conservative and vice versa. Um, it can be perfectly conservative, but when stuff reprojects off the edge of the screen, you should really always draw it in that case because you don't know whether it's reprojected into occluder or not occluder. But most of the time, it's better if you treat it as though it's clamped to the screen because as you're looking around, the, the occluders don't move that fast. If you have a game with lots of parallax and stuff kind of whizzing past you, then you need a, a more conservative scheme. Uh, so there's the occlusion buffer uh, at the bottom of the screen, and you can see the, the MIT levels as you, you go across to the right. Uh, everywhere we frust and cull, we occlusion cull. Uh, so for every KD tree node, every durable object, every durable setup, and the static scene, every query instance is occlusion culled. And we use the same input data and the algor same algorithm on the CPU and GPU, although for the CPU, we kind of truncate the MIP chain at the top so it doesn't start with the biggest MIP. It starts a couple of MIPs down. Um, yeah, and we don't do it for shadows yet, but we need to do some work on this to support it in more places, uh, particularly shadow rendering, and um, deal with some of the not perfect conservatism stuff so we can support more movement, I guess, um, near to the camera without causing popping. Cool, thanks. I was glad that I was prepared for that one. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, anything else? Otherwise, I think we're probably at time. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks very much.